Chapter 3 Pam picked up the phone, determined to call Reva back and tell her what she really thought of her. What have I ever done to her, Pam wondered, sitting on the edge of her bed, staring at the phone receiver in her hand. I've always been nice to her. I've never told her how everyone at Shadyside High hates her guts. A strong gust of wind rattled her bedroom windows. Pam felt a breeze, shivered, and reached for a tissue to wipe her runny nose. It's no wonder I have colds all winter, she thought bitterly. This old house is so drafty. The radiator under the window steamed, but not much heat came up. Another strong wind gust seemed to shake the entire house. Pam put down the receiver. What was the point of calling Reva? Pam knew there was no way of getting through to her. She could never have an honest conversation with her cousin. Reva was too cold, too hung up, too sarcastic to really talk to. Reva only liked to talk about the things she owned, the fancy, exotic places she'd been scuba diving, and the boys she'd broken up with. I can't believe two cousins can have so little in common, Pam thought. She retrieved her old teddy bear from the floor, blew a dust ball off its head, and returned it to the foot of her bed. She still felt edgy, pent up. I'll call Foxy, she decided. Foxy was her boyfriend and was always willing to listen to her and her troubles. It was one of his best qualities, she knew. Of course, Foxy has a lot of good qualities, she added. He's a real teddy bear, too. She started to punch in his number, then remembered that he had a social studies project to finish. Some long research paper on the Brazilian rainforest. Oh well, she replaced the receiver. I've got to get out of here, she thought. If I have to stay home tonight, listening to the wind rattle the windows and thinking about Riva and how I don't have a job and don't have a penny to spend on Christmas presents this year, I'll go bananas. Maybe I'll borrow Dad's car and cruise around for a bit. No, that won't take my mind off anything. I'll just think in the car and end up even more angry. She punched in a different number on the phone and reached her friend Mickey Wigley. Mickey was going to meet his good friend Clay Parker at the 7-Eleven on Mission Street. I'll meet you there too, Pam said eagerly. The clunky, old Pontiac Grand Prix her father had bought third hand protested at first, but on the third try the engine did kick over. Pam let it warm up for a while, the way her father had instructed, then backed out the gravel drive and headed down Fear Street. It was a blustery night, clear and cold. There were a million stars overhead, and the full moon gave almost as much light as the streetlights. The wind howled like a ghost. Pam held her breath as she drove past the Fear Street Cemetery. A silly superstition, she knew, but she did hold her breath every time. As she pulled into the small parking lot in front of the 7-Eleven, Pam could see both boys through the glass storefront. Seeing them immediately made her feel better. She slammed the car door and, wrapping her wool muffler high around her neck, hurried into the store. Mickey had a candy bar in his hand as usual. He smiled at her in greeting, his teeth covered with chocolate. Mickey was short and very thin. He had inch-long blonde hair and blue eyes and was kind of goofy-looking, Pam thought with his face full of freckles and big jug ears that stuck out a mile on either side of his head. He had a bad complexion, maybe because of all the chocolate bars he consumed, and always managed to appear awkward and uncomfortable, even when he wasn't. Clay was also very thin, but taller and lanky. He had brown hair that he wore slicked straight back, a mysterious scar over his right eyebrow, and steel gray eyes, restless eyes. Walking stoop-shouldered, a hard expression on his face, Clay always seemed nervous, jittery, with enough raw energy to make him ready to explode. Pam was really fond of Mickey. They'd been friends since childhood. Until fairly recently, Mickey had always been just a funny, goofy guy, always great fun to be around. In recent months, though, he'd become more quiet, even sullen. He didn't joke around as much, and he often seemed to be daydreaming, lost in thought. Clay was Mickey's friend, so Pam tried to like him too. But there was a side of Clay that frightened her, an angry side. Clay couldn't seem to control his temper. He'd been in several fights in school, and had even been suspended once for a week. Yo, Clay called to her from the potato chip rack. Mickey turned away from the candy bars. Hey, how's it going, man? He called everyone man, even Pam. I've been better, Pam said, searching her jeans pocket for a tissue to wipe her nose. What's happening? I don't see any zag nuts, Mickey complained, scratching his short blonde hair before pawing through a shelf of chocolate bars. Zag nuts? Who eats zag nuts? Pam asked. They don't even make them anymore, Clay said, selecting a bag of barbecue-flavored potato chips. They don't? Mickey looked really worried. Have you tried the dark chocolate monkey ways? Pam asked. Of course, Mickey replied. That's his breakfast, Clay cracked. Hey, man, did they really stop making Zagnuts? Mickey asked, upset. Why don't you write to the company and ask? Pam suggested, reading the headlines on the Star and the National Enquirer. Yeah, Clay said. Write to Mr. Zagnut himself. Dear Mr. Zagnut, I am desperate. I don't think there is a Mr. Zagnut, Mickey said seriously. Pam and Clay both laughed. 
Pam glanced up to the front of the store and saw the cashier, a heavy-set young guy with long, frizzy hair down to his shoulders and a thick, ragged mustache, staring at them suspiciously. We're being watched, she told her two friends. They both followed her glance. Let's get out of here, Clay said, making a disgusted face. Mickey grabbed up a few more candy bars. Clay picked up a two-liter bottle of Coke to go with the potato chips. Pam followed them to the cashier. They dumped the items on the counter. The cashier grunted disapprovingly. The rest of it, he said, staring hard at Clay with his little black beady eyes. Huh, Clay replied. The rest of it, the cashier repeated mysteriously, pointing with a pudgy hand. Clay glared back at him with his hands resting on the counter. What are you talking about, man? Mickey asked. Empty your coat pockets, please, the cashier insisted in a low voice. Mickey's mouth dropped open. Clay didn't move, but Pam saw that his face had turned bright red. They don't have anything in their pockets, Pam told the cashier. He ignored her, his eyes leveled on Clay. Just empty your pockets, he said wearily. You want to see my gloves, Clay asked, pretending to be confused. That's all I've got in my pockets, just my gloves. Empty your pockets, the cashier repeated. Hey, he's some kind of miracle, Clay said loudly, turning to Mickey and pointing at the cashier. Huh? Miracle? What do you mean, Mickey asked, confused. Well, you ever see a pig that could grow a mustache, Clay asked. He and Mickey laughed loudly, nervously. The cashier didn't move. Really, they're not stealing anything, Pam insisted shrilly. There's nothing in their pockets. Bring this stuff up, Clay told the cashier, narrowing his gray eyes menacingly, leaning over the counter toward the man. Not till you empty your pockets, the cashier insisted, not backing away from Clay. Empty them now, or I call the cops. I'm not going to have you punks stealing from this store. Come on, man, Mickey said to Clay, his eyes suddenly wide with fear. Let's just go. He pulled up the sleeve of Clay's cotton jacket, but Clay jerked his arm away. I'm not a punk, Clay told the cashier in a low, threatening voice. Eddie, the cashier yelled at the back of the store, call the police. Come on, let's go, Mickey pleaded. Mickey's right, Pam told Clay. Let's just go. You're not going anywhere till you empty your pockets, the cashier said angrily. Then he shouted toward the back again. Eddie, did you call? Clay moved so quickly that Pam let out a startled shriek. He grabbed the cashier's shirt front with both hands and pulled him against the cash register, hard. Oh! The cashier's mouth dropped open in surprise. He raised his hands as if to protect himself. Clay vaulted over the counter, his long legs flying, and grabbed the man again, this time by the throat. Clay, no! Pam screamed. Mickey took a step back, his expression frightened. Clay, let go of him! Pam insisted. But Clay didn't seem to hear her. He shoved the cashier this time, slamming him into the cash register. The fat cashier raised his arms in surrender, but Clay shoved him again, harder. Clay, please, Pam begged. Then she heard the police sirens. They seemed to be right outside the store. Chapter 4 Pam started for the door, the sirens wailing insistently. She turned to see Mickey right behind her. He was very pale, his blue eyes revealing his fear. She saw Clay finally let go of the cashier. As the shaken man stood staring in disbelief, Clay vaulted back over the counter and ran to join her and Mickey. A second later, the three were racing across the asphalt parking lot to Pam's car. The sirens were louder now. The police had to be only a block or two away. They piled into Pam's Pontiac, Clay taking the wheel, Pam beside him, Mickey in the back. Her hand trembling, Pam gave Clay the key. He jammed it into the ignition, turned it, and floored the gas pedal. Nothing. Try it again. Quick, Pam cried. The sirens were right behind them, on all sides of them, over them, under them. The sound seemed to be coming from inside the car. Clay turned the ignition again, his steel gray eyes calmly staring into the rearview mirror, watching for the police black and whites. The engine rumbled. It creaked. It resisted. Then it turned over. Clay shifted into reverse, pulled back, shifted again, then roared toward the exit, all four tires whining in protest in the asphalt. The cops! They're right behind us! Mickey shouted, his voice almost as high as the wailing siren. He was twisted around in the back seat, staring out the rear window. I think there's only one cruiser! Fasten your seat belts, Clay cried. He tromped down hard on a gas pedal, and the big car shot forward with a jolt that sent Pam's head back against the headrest. Clay, stop, she shouted. It's my dad's car! He... Clay spun the wheel hard, and the tires squealed, making the first sharp turn. He roared through a red light and kept going, his eyes straight ahead, not blinking, not revealing any fear, any excitement, any emotion at all. Wow! Mickey exclaimed from the back. Man, you've got this crate up to 95! The siren was so close it seemed to be coming from the back seat. Pam closed her eyes and covered her face with both hands as Clay squealed around another corner. Pull over! Pull over! 
came the distorted voice of an officer from the loudspeaker on the black and white. This is the police. Pull over. Clay laughed a high-pitched laugh. The police, he cried. I thought it was Santa Claus. Pull over. Pull over. But instead of slowing, Clay gunned the engine, pushing harder on the gas as they roared from one narrow street to another. Pam gingerly opened her eyes and gazed at the speedometer. The needle was as high as it could go. Clay peeled around another corner, then made a sharp right onto a narrow street that a trailer truck almost totally blocked. They're going to shoot us, Pam thought, just like on TV. They're going to start shooting at us. No, Pam shrieked as the truck slowly pulled out from the curb in front of them. The car was heading right for the back of it. Clay, stop! Instead of hitting the brakes, Clay spun the wheel. The car swerved up onto the sidewalk, missing a mailbox by less than an inch, and rolled past the truck, quickly leaving it behind, its horn honking wildly. Then Clay spun the wheel to the right, and they bumped off the sidewalk and, sailing through a red light, took the next right. Pam struggled to catch her breath. Mickey hadn't made a sound in a long while. Clay stared straight ahead, his face still motionless except for the beginnings of a smile frozen on his lips. The car tore through a stop sign, then swerved past a group of teenagers crossing the street. The blocks rushed by the window in a blur of yellow light and dark shadow. It took Pam a long while to realize that they had lost the police car. Mickey was still silent. She turned her head to the back to see if he was okay. He was sitting stiffly against the door, staring out the window, both hands gripping the seatbelt across his waist. Clay didn't slow the car until they were a block from his house. Then, peering into the rearview mirror, he took his foot off the gas, and the speedometer needle finally began to slip back. Yo! Clay screamed at the top of his lungs. Where'd they go? Pam could still hear the siren ringing in her ears. She wondered if the sound would ever go away. Wow! Mickey cried, finally speaking. Wow! Wow, wow, wow! He had a silly grin on his face, and his body seemed to collapse. He slumped down in his seat and let go of his grip on the seatbelt. We lost them, Pam cried, her heart pounding. We really lost them. Clay pulled the car to the curb in front of his small red brick house. He threw back his head and laughed with triumph, a laugh Pam had never heard before. Man, that was great, Mickey declared excitedly. Great, he pounded Clay on the shoulder. You did it, man. You did it. When that truck pulled out, I thought we'd had it, Pam said, squeezing Clay's arm. That's when we lost the police, Clay told them, his eyes glowing with excitement. That truck cut them off, and we were out of there. All three of them laughed, a mixture of relief and victory. That was awesome, Mickey declared. Awesome! He reached into the front seat to slap Clay a high five. Then his expression changed. Pam, your license plate. The police. They must have gotten the number during the chase. Bet they didn't, Pam replied, smiling. The plate is off and back. It fell off last week. Dad hasn't had a chance to replace it. All three of them burst out laughing. They were too worked up to stay in the car. They bounded out onto the sidewalk, whooping and cheering. I was so scared, Pam confessed. I've never been that scared before. Secretly, she admitted to herself that she also found the car chase really exciting. The wind had died down a bit, but she tightened a wool muffler around her sore throat. Clay suddenly had a very devilish expression on his face. Hey guys, look what I got, he said. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a can of jalapeno dip. Clay, Pam cried, truly shocked. Mickey gaped, swallowing hard. You mean? It was supposed to go with the chips, Clay said. He laughed and tossed the can high in the air, catching it one-handed when it came down. Whoa, I don't believe it. The 7-Eleven guy was right, Mickey said, shaking with laughter. I didn't like his attitude, Clay said, grinning and twirling the stolen can in his hand. Pam suddenly didn't feel like laughing anymore. A picture flashed into her mind of Clay grabbing the cashier by the throat and pushing him into the cash register. Earlier, she had thought that maybe Clay was justified in losing his temper. Nobody likes to be accused of stealing, but Clay really had been stealing. Pam leaned back against the car. You have to learn to control your temper, she told Clay softly. He stepped toward her out of the shadows, and his face glowed under the streetlight. Hey, I've got to have some fun, he said, sounding bitter. Pam started to say something, but Mickey interrupted. Clay is right, man. That ride we had tonight? That was the most fun I've had in years. But Mickey, Pam started. We could have been arrested. We could have been... She didn't finish her thought. Big deal, Mickey said, kicking a small rock over the curb. At least we had a little fun. You know what kind of holiday I'm going to have? My dad was just fired. Do you believe it? He worked at your uncle's store for 25 years and he gets fired a month before Christmas. Pam put an arm around Mickey's shoulder and gave him an affectionate hug. Don't mention my uncle's store to me, she said softly. How come? Mickey asked. Pam groaned. Well, I can't even get a vacation job there. Huh? Clay tossed a stolen can to Mickey, who missed. It dropped onto the street. You heard me, Pam said bitterly. I said I couldn't get a job at Dalby's. My cousin said... 
But Mitch Castellona called me just before I met Mickey, Clay told her. Mitch said your cousin Reva was giving out jobs. Mitch got one, and so did Lisa. Pam felt her throat tighten in anger. Reva gave them jobs? She asked shrilly. When? Tonight, Clay told her. Pam let out a cry of disgust. She gave them jobs tonight? Clay nodded. Pam furiously tossed the end of the muffler back over her shoulder. I'm going to get Reva, she said in a low voice she didn't recognize. I don't know what I'm going to do, but somehow, I'm really going to get her. Chapter 5 Reva maneuvered the silver Volvo with her left hand, leaving her right hand free to push the radio buttons. They play the worst music at Christmas time, she thought, stabbing quickly from station to station. If I have to hear a grandma got run over by a reindeer one more time, I'll scream. It was a gray Sunday, cool and damp. The sun had come out briefly in the morning, then retreated behind a thick curtain of clouds. Feeling tense and out of sorts, Reva had driven to her health club, intending to jog and work out for a while, and then take a swim. But the pool was closed because of some sort of filter problem, and so her plans were frustrated. Now, as she was driving past sprawling Shadyside High School, Reva wondered how she could fill up the rest of the afternoon. The tall evergreen near the main entrance of the school had been decked with twinkling Christmas lights, which were turned on even though it was the middle of the afternoon. The school was closed and dark, no sign of life. Just six more months and I'll be out of there forever, Reva thought with a mixture of emotions, eagerness and relief, tinged with sadness. She had been accepted at Smith, her first choice, and would be heading there in the fall. She was thinking about how senior year was turning out to be the longest year of her life, when she spotted someone she knew, loping along the sidewalk. Hitting the brake, she pulled over to the curb and lowered the passenger side window. Hey, Rob! Rob Spring had been walking with his hands in his coat pockets, leaning into the wind, his bare head lowered. He looked up as Reva called to him and smiled when he recognized her. Hi, Reva called, smiling back. She'd always liked Rob. For years, he'd followed her around like an adoring puppy. He was nice and funny, a lot of fun, but she'd never go out with him because he was overweight. I just couldn't go out with such a buffalo, Reva told herself. She hadn't been very subtle about turning him down, and eventually he had given up. She hadn't really talked with him in months. He had a girlfriend she knew, and he was very involved with the jazz quartet he had formed. She had heard that he was a very talented pianist, but had never heard him play. Reva, how you doing? He came trotting over, his breath steaming up in front of him. Rob's curly brown hair was unbrushed as usual. His brown eyes, which always seemed to be laughing, peered into her car. I'm doing okay, Reva said. How are you doing? He shrugged and laughed. Okay, I guess. Just running some errands from my mom. You're such a good boy, Rob, she teased. I can be bad, too, he replied suggestively, leaning into the car with his head lowered. They chatted for a while, catching up. Then as they talked, Reva had an inspiration. Rob would make a great store Santa, she thought. Daddy said one of the Santas had quit, and he needs a replacement. Well, Rob would be perfect. He's so jolly. He has just the right personality for it. And he's so roly-poly, he wouldn't even need any padding. Hey, Rob, do you need a job this Christmas? She asked, pleased as she thought about how happy her dad would be with her. Yeah, I guess, Rob said. I plan to pick up some money shoveling driveways for people. But it's been a little slow, since it hasn't snowed. I offered to shovel anyway. You know, for half price. But no takers. He grinned at her, his round face pink from the cold. No, I'm serious, Reva said. My dad said I could hire some people to work at the store. You know, Dalby's. Really? His expression turned serious. Well, that would be excellent, Reva. You know... Things have been tough at my house. We could really use the money. Well, great, Reva said. You can start Saturday. For real, he asked. Yeah, for real, she told him, wondering why he never brushed his hair. She suddenly had another idea. Why not play a little joke on Rob, too? He had a good sense of humor. He'd appreciate it. Eventually. Maybe. Listen, I have a special job in mind for you, she said, picturing him in a Santa Claus suit. Huh? What kind of job? It's a, uh... Public relations job, she said. He looked doubtful. Public relations? I don't know anything about public relations. Don't worry, she assured him. You'll be great at it, really. She couldn't wait to see him sitting on Santa's enormous throne with a sticky finger kid sitting on his lap, pulling at his white beard. His dark eyes were lit up with excitement. Thanks, Reva, he said. This is really nice of you. See you at the store, about 8.30, she said. As he thanked her again, she pushed the button to roll up the window and headed down the street. What a hoot, she thought. She couldn't wait till Saturday morning. Rob would show up in a suit and tie, no doubt. 
ready to begin his important public relations job, only to be handed a bright red Santa costume, complete with beard, wig, and stupid pointy hat. And Lisa will be standing there in her glitziest dress and be sent to the stockroom to unload boxes and stock shelves. They'll be mortified, Reba thought, grinning from ear to ear. Mortified. Congratulating herself on her cleverness, she pulled into her driveway, heading along the row of tall hedges to the four-car garage in back. That night, Reva's father went out, leaving her to babysit for Michael. She played an endless hour of shoots and ladders with him, then settled him down with a cartoon tape on a VCR so she could have some time to herself. She didn't get him to bed until nearly ten, more than an hour past his normal weekend bedtime. He seemed nervous and clingy and kept making up excuses not to go to bed. The poor guy is lonely, Reva thought, but what am I supposed to do about it? An entire hour of shoots and ladders is cruel and unusual punishment. Finally, Michael agreed to be tucked in only on the promise that Reva would wake him when their father got home so that he could say goodnight to him. Reva promised with her fingers crossed, turned out the light on his dresser, leaving only the nightlight on, and crept downstairs. He's sweet, but he's a pest, she decided. I can think of better things to do at night than this. She suddenly thought of Mitch Castellona and wondered what he was doing right then. Out somewhere with Lisa, no doubt. Well, enjoy it while you can, Lisa, Reva thought. In a few weeks, you'll be the one sitting home, while I'm out having fun with your precious Mitch. She picked up the new issue of Vogue up off the coffee table and sat down in a big overstuffed armchair by the fireplace to thumb through it. She was nearly done, having stopped to read only photo captions, when she heard a loud knock on the door. Oh! The sudden barrage of sound startled her. She turned toward the front hall. Who could it be this late? She hurried to the front hall and put her face close to the door. Who is it? she called. No reply. Who is it? Reva repeated, listening hard to the silence, suddenly filled with dread. Chapter 6 Who's there? Reva repeated sharply. It's me, a voice said finally. A boy's voice. Hank's voice. She made a disgusted face and reluctantly pulled open the door. A cold rush of air blew into the room as Hank, smiling, walked past her into the entryway. Hank, what do you want? Reva asked coldly. He wore a bulky 50s-style overcoat, unbuttoned, revealing a gray sweatshirt underneath. His spiky blonde hair caught the light from above. He continued to smile warmly at her, as if nothing had happened between them, as if she hadn't broken up with him so cruelly. Can we talk for a few minutes? he asked almost shyly. What for? Reva asked, blocking his way into the living room. I, I've been trying to call you, he said, his expression serious. I left messages on your machine. You didn't call me back. I know, Reva said, rolling her eyes. Maybe you should have taken the hint. She walked past him to the front door, pushed open the storm door, and held it for him. Good night, Hank. He brushed past her and went out onto the front porch. I just want to ask you something, he said quietly, avoiding her eyes. A favor. Not about us, okay? Warily, she followed him out onto the porch but didn't say anything. Another blast of cold air made his heavy overcoat flap noisily. He pulled it tighter. What's the favor? Hurry up, it's freezing, Reva said impatiently. I'm sorry, Reva. This isn't easy for me. What do you want? Reva asked, unwilling to soften her tone. What was he doing here anyway? She was so finished with him. Finished. I, uh, heard you were giving out jobs. I, uh, wondered if there were any left, Hank said, blushing, you know, at your father's store. Reva laughed cruelly. For you? I could really use a job, Reva. This was hard for me to come here tonight, you know? Okay, so you don't want to go out with me anymore. All right, but if there are jobs available, I thought. His voice trailed off. Reva's cold glare wasn't making it any easier for him. I don't think so, Hank, she said quietly. Huh? He stared at her, not believing her casual cruelty. I don't think so, she repeated, not bothering to hide her amusement. With an angry cry, he grabbed her arm. What is your problem? He screamed. Let go of me, Reva ordered but he gripped her arm even tighter. Seething with anger, he glared at her. Why are you doing this to me? Let go, she cried, more angry than frightened. And then suddenly, she put her teeth together and whistled, a piercing, high-pitched, steady tone. Hank's eyes opened wide in surprise and confusion as he dropped her arm. A second later, the shrubs behind the house began to rustle. Then they both heard a low growl, a frightening sound that rapidly became louder, closer, and, roaring out of the darkness, came King, the Dalby's guard dog, their well-trained Doberman, obeying his attack signal, Reva's whistle. 
The dog had ignored Hank earlier because Hank was a familiar guest at the Dolby house, but now this was the signal, time to attack. The dog's eyes flared red, then, snarling with automatic rage, the enormous Doberman raised his powerful front paws and leapt against Hank's chest. Hank cried out, stumbling two steps backward, Reva, stop him! Ignoring Hank's cries, Reva moved away, her eyes wide with excitement. The snarling dog snapped its jaws against the sleeve of Hank's overcoat. Hank jerked his arm away, gained his balance, and took off across the lawn. The dog followed, furiously leaping at Hank's back, biting at Hank's legs. Reva watched from the porch, waiting until Hank was all the way to the street before she gave a second whistle, signaling the dog to cease its attack. Hearing the whistle, the Doberman stopped in its tracks as if its power switch had been turned off. Panting loudly, it turned and stared expectantly up the lawn at Reva. Hank pulled open his car door and started to climb inside. But realizing his attacker had been called off, he stopped and, holding on to the car door, stared back at Reva. She could see the anger on his face illuminated by the light from inside the car. I'll pay you back, he yelled. Reva, do you hear me? Reva laughed scornfully. Don't you like to play with King? she called. She tilted her head back and whistled loudly again. Instantly, the Doberman sprang to life, deep growl signaling his violent intent. Reva watched as Hank dove behind the wheel and slammed the car door. A few seconds later, he peeled away, leaving the howling, disappointed attack dog at the curb. Reva hurried back into the house, closed the door, and locked it behind her. She shivered. Hank was so ridiculous, she thought. The look on his face when he realized the dog was after him? What a laugh, Reva thought. What a laugh.